Japan or from Korea, somewhere else, and then find it's rejected. So you often now see testing of food and certification of food prior to export. Border inspection posts in most of the importing countries test foods to make sure that they're meeting their local regulations. And of course, there's food safety control procedures in place in most countries. There's control in the marketplace, there's food surveillance. So we've moved to a situation where food, instead of being grown locally and tested only once, is now grown in one half of the world, transported around the world, and tested several times before it reaches the shops. So testing has become really critical in this long food chain. Now what I want to do now is very quickly go through topic by topic the areas of food safety that we have concerns about. I'm not going to deal with biological hazards, largely because in this area we're concerned more with prevention than testing. So most microbiological control is through HACCP, hazard analysis, critical control points. It's about prevention of contamination of foods. So I'm not going to deal with these areas, but for completeness I've listed them on this, this slide. What I'm going to deal with are the areas of chemical contaminants in food. And I'm going to start at uh, one end of the food chain with environmental contaminants and then progressively move through the man-made chemicals here uh, to the factory where there's processor contaminants, additives, the packaged food, and finish with authenticity and traceability. And I'll do these topic by topic. Before I do that, I just want to really emphasize that food is a difficult matrix to analyze. It's really self-evident, but I think it's worth reminding ourselves that the skill in terms of analyzing food for these contaminants is knowing and understanding the matrix, knowing what it is you have to do to efficiently extract from that matrix and to provide adequate cleanup to concentrate your analyte and to remove all the potential interferences. And this is not a trivial process. And this stage where you have oranges, coffee or oil or wine coming into the laboratory, that stage where you have to handle the food is still remains one of the most difficult stages prior to going on and doing instrumental analysis. But let's, let's start looking at the different areas that historically have been of concern to us. Uh, we'll start with environmental contaminants. The issue here is that we dispose of uh, our waste materials either through incineration, so we dispose through burning and contaminating the air in the atmosphere, or we dispose by landfill, we fill into the ground. And in either event, you get contamination of soil, you get deposition of particulate material onto growing vegetables, um, you get contamination of uh, animal products because animals graze on grass. So whatever you do to the environment ends up contaminating parts of the food chain. Historically the areas that come to mind immediately are the dioxins, the furans and the PCBs. These have been environmental contaminants that have been of concern for quite a few uh, years. The issue and the challenge here is that they're not single compounds. So the polychlorinated dibenzodioxins, the dioxins, comprise 75 congeners. And these are not all of the same toxicity. There's, there's, there's half a dozen, there's uh, five to ten of these that have a high toxicity. The remainder are relatively non-toxic, which means that analytically you have to separate each of these and measure with a high degree of accuracy those congeners which are toxic. So scientifically, we need high sensitivity to get down to parts per trillion. We need very high specificity, and we measure individual congeners. Same applies to the furans and the PCBs and, and the PAHs. And the EU regulates this area. So animal products, uh, dairy products, uh, meat products, and fish, there are limits set for TEQs for dioxins, PCBs, uh, and furans. The analytical solution is to carry out extensive sample cleanup. 
you can't get away from uh, traditional column chromatography. There's also carbon column fractionation used uh, in, in this area. And you have to use high resolution GCMS. So you operate it around uh, 15,000 uh, resolution. And normally, something like 20 C13 stable isotopes are added as internal standards in this analysis. The result of all this is that the cost of doing this analysis is high. It's around 1,000 US dollars per sample as a minimum cost. So it's an expensive analysis. It's probably the most expensive uh, single analysis in, in the food safety area. If I'm exporting uh, a, f a food product, and I need a certificate to show that my product meets EU requirements for dioxins and furans. I'm not very excited about paying uh, $1,000 per sample. So the business driver here is very much to get the cost of this analysis down lower and also to increase the speed of analysis because it takes about a week at the moment to do a batch of samples. So this is an area where cost is really too high and there are moves to introduce lower cost screening methods. There's one called the Kalux assay that's a lower cost screening method you can use. I'll move on now to the uh, natural toxins. As I mentioned in the earlier slide when we looked at the food chain, these um, natural toxins, the mycotoxins, are secondary metabolites from, uh, from molds, from fungi. The problem is that uh, it's not as you might find in the home where a food is molded, where you see it, visible evidence of mold, where you get fungal infection of agricultural crops. Often the crop looks quite sound. You can't simply by inspection see that there's a, there's a fungal problem. The crop looks sound, but it's still contaminated with mycotoxins. So if, if you look at a, a sample of peanuts that's highly contaminated with aflatoxins, the physical appearance generally is, is, is satisfactory, so you, you wouldn't know that it was contaminated. The mycotoxins that we're interested in are the, are the aflatoxins, octoxin A, the fusarium toxins, deoxynivalenol, nivalenol, uh, zeralinone, the fumonacins that are a contaminant of, of corn, maize, and patulin that's a contaminant of apple juice. We, we tend at the moment in food safety testing labs to have single methods of analysis dedicated to each mycotoxin. So routinely labs will have a fluorescence HPLC set up uh, with post-column derivatization for aflatoxin analysis. And they'll have a separate procedure set up for deoxynivalenol and fumonacins. I think one of the scientific challenges is whether we can bring these methods together and have a single method that's covering a range of different mycotoxins. And increasingly you'll see papers where LCMS MS is being used. It's again a highly regulated area in the EU. We have limits of 0.1 PPB for aflatoxin B1 in baby food up to much higher levels for the less toxic mycotoxins like deoxynivalenol. The other problem I should mention that's a little bit unique to mycotoxins is that the contamination is not uniform. It's a, uh, infection of agricultural products with fungi is a random event. So with peanuts in the ground, it's not every kernel that's infected. With tree nuts, it's not every nut. With corn, it's not every maize kernel that's infected. So it's a random event. And you have a small number of units, a small number of uh, peanuts that are highly contaminated, but the large majority are relatively uncontaminated. And this get, obtaining a representative sample for analysis remains a big challenge. And really the only solution to this is to take large sample sizes. So the EU uh, uh, in the regulations uh, has a sampling plan that uh, for regulatory purposes must be followed. And the sampling plan tells you you should take a minimum sample size of 30 kilograms from a lot. And the 30 kilogram sample should be made up of 100 subsamples here. And the procedure is to mix that 30 kilograms, divide it into three 10 kilogram samples, and then separately homogenize the 10 kilograms and take a subsample for analysis. 
So in the mycotoxin area, you have to take very large sample sizes, which you can imagine logistically is difficult in a laboratory. It's a very messy business, and you've got to dispose of this waste food material. LCMS is being used increasingly for multitoxin uh, analysis, and the business challenge really is to bring these tests together into a single method. I want to deviate a little bit from uh, going through the food chain just to illustrate one point in the mycotoxin area, and that's some of the benefits that you can get from going to faster methods of analysis. Um, some years ago, these low, small particle columns were introduced uh, for faster analysis. And if you look at the mycotoxin area, for ocrotoxin A, you can move from eight-minute retention time to two, for the aflatoxins, you can make similar time savings. For the fumonosins that require derivatization, normally you form the OPA derivative. The analysis time is 45 minutes. If you go to LCMS with a fast column, you can come down to about four and a half minutes. So you can make quite a big time saving. So fast analysis means you can actually um, uh, uh, run your chromatograms rather, very, very quickly. And as you can see here, you, you don't lose much in terms of performance. So this shows the separation of aflatoxins G2, G1, B2 and B1 on a conventional column, where admittedly there's very good baseline separation. As you go to fast chromatography, you've still got perfectly adequate separation in terms of measuring at B1 separately and measuring total aflatoxins. Now, often people say, well, you know, so what? You see many papers published where people are trying to beat the record and do things faster and faster. And, uh, but in business terms, this can actually make a significant difference. And I've illustrated this uh, with some calculations from a laboratory in Turkey. And their business is to test dried figs. Dried figs have an aflatoxin contamination problem. Dried figs are exported to uh, Europe, particularly in the period coming up to Christmas. And this laboratory has the job of testing all the consignments of dried figs for aflatoxin. And their workload is around 4,000 batches of samples each year. So if you remember, I said you have to analyze uh, three 10 kilogram samples. And if you do the calculations with spikes and blanks and uh, calibration and everything else, it's around 15,000 analytical runs each year. Now, by conventional HPLC, it means you've got to have about 30 hours of HPLC time available each day. But if you move to the fast chromatography conditions to do this, you can do it comfortably in a working day with one HPLC system. So looking at uh, speed of analysis, if you're doing a lot of routine analysis, can make a big difference. And it also means you can turn the results around much more quickly, which is increasingly important these days. But coming back to the food chain, so we, we looked at environmental contaminants, looked at mycotoxins. I want to look at the toxins that are called phycotoxins, or some people call them marine uh, biotoxins or seafood toxins. Now these are formed uh, when there's contamination of the seawater with uh, an algal bloom. It's sometimes when there's a severe problem, you can see it with a red coloration in the sea. And these are dinoflagellates, uh, two-cell organisms that uh, shellfish feed upon these organisms. These organisms accumulate toxins. And when the shellfish feed on the algae, you get an accumulation of the toxins in the muscle of, of the shellfish. Now, traditionally, the seawater is monitored for these toxins, but also as well the shellfish are monitored. And it isn't just uh, single compounds, as is the case with the mycotoxins. You're dealing with groups of compounds, like the PSP toxins, which is paralytic shellfish poisoning toxins, or DSP toxins, or ASP toxins. And each one of these toxins contains a complex group of compounds. Now, because we don't understand fully the pattern of these compounds and we don't understand fully their toxic <coughs> behavior, 
traditionally the analytical method that is still used is the mouse bioassay. I don't know whether you know this assay in Korea, but it, it's not an instrumental technique. You actually use a mouse for this test, and you have to extract the flesh of the shellfish. You, you boil it with an extraction solvent, and you inject that extract into a mouse. And you simply you watch and time how long from injection to death of that mouse. So it's not a very pleasant assay uh, to conduct. And increasingly, of course, th there's pressure to, re to replace the mouse bioassay with instrumental methods. And more and more now people are using uh, HPLC with fluorescence and LC MSMS. So moving through the food chain, uh, I want to come now to man-made chemicals. So here we're deliberately using uh, uh, chemicals because we need to do this because our crops are constantly under attack from, her from weeds, from uh, fungi or molds, from insects, from rodents or whatever. So within the class of pesticides, there's a whole range of different uh, chemicals that are used for different reasons. We have to use these, but they are authorized chemicals. We know a lot about the toxicology. We know about the environmental behavior of these chemicals. And we know that when they're used according to good agricultural practice, the residues that are present in the food products can be minimized. So if they're used under good agricultural practice, you can ensure that the levels are below the maximum residue limits. So it's, it's different from the other contaminants where uh, you can't control them. It's a, a process which is a little bit outside our control. We're dealing with a lot of compounds here. Worldwide, there's probably a 1,000 uh, pesticides that are authorized for use. In the EU, there's five or 600. The organophosphorus are probably the most widespread pesticides used now for treatment of fruit and vegetables. Historically, the organochlorine compounds were used, but uh, they're not used so much now. The challenge scientifically is to increase the number of pesticides into the methods so that you're monitoring the maximum possible number in a single analysis. And it's not uncommon now to see people doing at least 200 uh, pesticides in a single assay by LC MSMS. And increasingly, I think we'll see more and more uh, residues being added to the methods to increase the extent you can screen by a single method. There still remain some pesticides that are intractable, very difficult to analyze. There still remain some matrices that cause particular problems in the pesticide area. The business driver, the thing we're asked all the time to do, is to bring down the cost and increase speed of analysis. And there are things that are helping here. The uh, catcher's cleanup is increasingly being used. It's a, it's a cheaper, quicker, faster way of cleaning up samples. And you see lots of methods published using catchers. But LCMSMS is increasingly the method of choice for pesticide analysis. Again, it's a highly regulated area. The E.